How's it going guys? My name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. I haven't done a video like this in a while where I kind of just sit and talk about a thing that I find interesting and I have a busy week right now. These are pretty easy to hammer out and so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna get it out there and have a little fun with it. I have not been shy about sharing my distaste and general hatred for the way that Sony and Marvel have been jerking around the rights to Spider-Man in movies. They're constantly trying to wrestle away control from one another and they're creating this series of connected, not connected movies. I don't really know how the general audience is supposed to perceive, and they're not really doing anything to help with that perception. I have to assume that they've both come to realize that the most money to be made is working together in the long term, and they're simply trying to strong arm one another to get a bigger piece of that pie. It makes sense from a business perspective. I don't think either one of them is truly willing to terminate that partnership. And at the end of the day, I just selfishly want these characters to all exist in a shared universe together. It's as simple as that, I think it's better for the fans. Besides simply being allowed to continue using Spider-Man, I so badly want to see Feige and Marvel come up with a way to use Venom and Carnage. They're two of my childhood favorites, and Venom has just been done dirty on the big screen. I don't like either version of the character we've seen. I used to have the Venom Saga from the old animated series on VHS, and I would watch that endlessly. Watching that series of episodes as its own isolated movie is up there for me in animated superhero god tier level with Mask of the Phantasm. It's an incredible arc, it's so well done, in a desperate hope to have something close to that on the big screen. I've envisioned a storyline in which Sony and Marvel both continue to use Venom, with absolutely no need to retcon anything from the existing movies, and hopefully for a low risk of confusing the general audience, certainly not any more confused than they likely already are. And the exciting thing is that I'm basing this on some groundwork these movies have already laid out. As you would have seen in the thumbnail title however I set this up, my pitch is that the MCU instead uses Mac Gargan's Venom. Who knows, maybe this is a, a theory, a prediction, maybe this is actually the route that they're building towards, but if not, I think it's a potential pivot that could help us see Venom in the MCU. Even if I do think Sony is garbage and they make garbage movies. Back in February, I got really excited about this theory that Sony and Marvel were setting themselves up to have two adjunct universes that had shared characters without interfering with one another. If you click that little card in the corner, it'll take you to that video and you can go and watch that. It's 20 minutes like this of me just rambling about comic book stuff and the, the MCU. <laughs> it's not required viewing, but what I have to say in this video kind of builds off of it. So in case you don't want to watch that whole 20 minute thing, here is the quickest shorthand of that. The theory is that these two universes would or could eventually cross over. Doctor Strange is establishing the multiverse. That concept was first teased in the Marvel Sony co-produced Spider-Man Far From Home. Sam Raimi, director known for doing the first three Spider-Man movies, is now directing Doctor Strange 2. Morbius the Living Vampire's solo film hints at Spidey and features Vulture. Marvel has announced that they intend to introduce Blade, a vampire hunter, as well as Monica Rambeau, a character that uses light and can easily trump vampires. Her hero debut is expected to be in WandaVision. That storyline leads straight into Doctor Strange 2, so she might appear in that film as well. Marvel could explain away vampires existing under everyone's nose through the multiverse, with Wanda, Steven, and Monica discovering a vampire world with Blade in it, which also happens to be Sony's Marvel Universe. A universe that seemingly at some point had a spider superhero and has Vulture as a villain, so presumably a lot of the events that have taken place have been the same between these two universes. These are just these side storylines the Avengers haven't heard about. And if they all bring it all together, they can have Blade hopping between universes that do and don't have vampires being useful in either. We can have Spider-Man come and go between the universes, he's supposedly missing in this Sony world, and all sorts of other multiverse shenanigans. I get into it in more depth than that other video. Shortly after publishing that, I started concocting this follow-up theory that maybe I wish I would have included over in that, but now I'm all worked up about it and it's expanded and grown and become its own thing, and now it gets its own dedicated video. I've been sitting on this back since February, thinking about it all the time, and it's I just gotta get it all out there. Largely, this theory is still predicated on that first one being true, and that they intend the multiverse to be an explanation for why Marvel and Sony are independently making movies and they both have Spider-Man villains and Spider-Man heroes and whatever else they have going on there, vampires in some worlds and not in others. But I think this theory, at least pieces of it, this new one, will still hold up separate from that. 
if only a fraction of these things end up being true, I think it still works. So we'll just we'll just carry on with this new Venom theory. Eddie Brock's Venomverse with Carnage and Morbius and apparently Vulture is its own thing and will continue to be separate. I imagine at some point it'll begin to feature some sort of spider hero. Whether or not Marvel stretches Tom Holland out so thin that he does nothing other than play Spider-Man in perpetuity and has to appear in both Marvel and Sony productions, I kind of doubt they'll do that. Eventually, he'll be relegated to Marvel only, even if he does cameo in the Sony movies, he'll primarily be a Marvel hero, and Sony will come up with something new, presumably something like Spider-Gwen. Maybe they do Miles Morales, but I kind of think they should save him over in the Spider-Verse animated series. That worked so well, and I would like to see that character explored in more depth there. Don't waste those storylines splitting it between live action and animated, unless you're going to tell us that they're all one world. And that's just, we have enough multiverse, Spider-Verse intersecting stuff going on already, okay? The web is Tangled. Spider-Gwen is a great character, gives us something new to be excited about, and Sony doesn't have to rely on this anti-hero shtick any longer. Not every villain needs a good side, okay? Sometimes it works better when they're just evil. No one's gonna go see a Rhino or a Puma movie. <laughs> Sooner or later, they need a hero focus. In the comics, Peter Parker was the first to wear the Venom suit. It fed off his pre-existing powers and created this mutually beneficial relationship. In other words, it was symbiotic. As it begins to affect and change Peter's personality, he grows afraid of what he's becoming and rids himself of the symbiote. Venom then instead binds with Eddie Brock, one of Peter's rivals from work, a struggling journalist himself. He blames Peter for pretty well all of his troubles. Independently, Eddie and Venom hate Peter Parker and Spider-Man. Together, they can channel all that hate to their common enemy. That particular dynamic is a lot more interesting to me when the entire world doesn't know that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. You know, Venom can kind of let him in on the secret. They both exploit what they know about those characters personally. I think it can still be a satisfying story regardless of that. It's just a shame that we kind of jumped past that point. In a later storyline, a ways later, in one of Marvel's attempts to shake things up, Brock loses the symbiote and it instead goes to Mac Gargan aka the Scorpion. The symbiote actually approaches him, offering him these superpowers and the ability to become the A-list villain he always wanted to be. When bonded with Venom, Gargan loses much of his own personality. He becomes dangerous, violent, and even cannibalistic. It's pretty gruesome. Whereas Eddie and Venom kind of worked together and had this give and take, Venom entirely just ramps up Gargan's more psychotic tendencies, his violence, his aggression. It operates a little bit more like what we see with Cletus Cassidy and Carnage, and they become a wild, lethal force. My theory, or perhaps wishful thinking here, is that Marvel and Sony have the perfect opportunity for them to both have their own spider hero, challenged by their own separate incarnations of Venom. We met Matt Gargan in Homecoming, played by the incredibly underrated Michael Mando, a thug who was thumped by Spider-Man and locked up because of it. There's pretty clearly a vendetta there, with Gargan actively looking to discover the true identity of Spider-Man something that his prison buddy, Adrian Toomes, knows. Now in the post credit scene of Far From Home, we see the return of J. Jonah Jameson. This in and of itself is wonderful news and something I'm so excited for. J.K. Simmons is perfect for this role, and seeing him return as some sort of web-based, pun intended, Infowars-like show could be a really exciting take on things. He is immediately shown with the classic spidey hate we've come to know and love from the man. He doesn't have the personal ties with Peter that make for an interesting dynamic where he hates Spider-Man and works with Peter and is pretty mean to Peter and all that going on, but he has to work with him because he has good pictures of Spider-Man. I guess we've already seen three movies of that. Classic Marvel, they'd probably want to do something a little bit different. In this brief appearance, he also spills the beans by revealing to the world the true identity of Spider-Man. Certainly makes Mac's job easier. It's kind of a shame that Vulture sitting on that knowledge didn't become more significant. No one had to force it out of him. But it could have simply been proof to the audience that Vulture isn't all bad and kind of has Peter's back. And if any of these villains do their research, connect the dots, and realize Adrian did personally know Peter and probably knew his identity, then they could hold that again. Him. The expected payoff of that has been removed, but it could still be important moving forwards. Now looking at the comic storyline, J. Jonah hires private investigator Matt Gargan to follow Peter Parker and find out how he gets such good photos of Spider-Man. With his spider senses, he's able to avoid it and is never caught by Gargan. This hunt eventually escalates for both JJ and Gargan, with Jameson offering to pay for an experimental procedure to equip him with super-powered weapons that mimic a common predator of spiders, a scorpion. 
the mutagenic process then drives Gargan insane, and those predatory instincts become exclusively his driving force. He started as a pretty regular dude, but as he starts to lose his marbles, he moves on to becoming a professional criminal, using that to fund this obsession, working entirely by the motivation to take down Spider-Man. Now looking to the MCU, we see many versions of these important story beats in place, just not quite how we're used to seeing them in the comics or in the Sony movies of past. I wish that sentence structure was less st stupid. <laughs> Too late, one take. It's been Marvel's MO with these Spider-Man movies to take things we're familiar with and put a little tweak on it, a little twist to make it fresh and new and fit into the larger world that they've crafted. Vulture isn't an old man that drains the life force of people. He's just kind of like a, a late to middle-aged dad who uses alien technology to fly around. Mysterio isn't a failed magician or illusionist who uses smoke and mirrors. He has this really advanced drone technology he uses and has a backstory directly tied to Tony Stark. Little tweaks that help modernize things and allow it to fit in the MCU. Matt Gargan is already a criminal, driven by his hatred for Spider-Man. So that motivation there hasn't really changed. Villains building enhanced super suits is typical of this world. J. Jonah continues to see Spider-Man as a menace, so those three things fit with how we would expect this to play out. Two new kind of wrenches in all of this that make it an entirely new story. The world already knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, and the multiverse is intended to be introduced after Spider-Man 3, which for my larger theory is important. For the MCU, maybe it's not that important to this particular movie, but I think it'll pay off long term and be very important to everything. My expected trajectory of this movie and future Spider-Man movies is as follows. In Spider-Man Home Something 3, Peter is going to be on the run. He's acting less as an outright hero and is more focused on protecting himself and those he loves. He's not going to be stopping bank robberies or stopping a plot to take down the, the city or the world or anything. It's entirely going to be about him. Think of John Wick 3. There's a contract out on his head. He has to navigate the entire city, working through underground networks and contacts that he has, trying his best to stay one step ahead while fighting everyone else off. In Spider-Man 3, we're going to have every available goon, miner, thug, and villain focusing on hunting Peter down. It's long been speculated that Kraven the Hunter will be the primary antagonist. This has never been confirmed, but the idea of him being the main threat hunting Peter would be really exciting and make a lot of sense thematically. JJ and Mysterio have outed his identity. Everyone wants a piece of that. There's a chance someone is going to put a bounty out there. But even without that, he does have quite a few enemies he's made along the way. And it would make sense for someone who's literally a professional hunter to be the main antagonist throughout that story. I don't really know how you bring that story to an end. It's not like at the end of the movie, people are going to forget that Peter Parker is Spider-Man, but at least people will maybe kind of learn to, to back off. Something I just thought of on the spot. I just don't, I don't see a good conclusion there. I guess that's I'm not a Hollywood screenwriter. I think there's still a strong possibility that Jay Jonah could fund and outfit Matt Gargan with a scorpion villain attire and, and equipment and to, to take on Spider-Man in his stead. He could literally buy the equipment and, and give it to Gargan himself, or he could simply be the one who puts a bounty on Spider-Man's head, which then motivates Gargan to spend the money on himself to be the guy who catches Spider-Man and, and claim the reward. It would probably be the latter, that he breaks himself out of jail, uses his connections with people like Tombs and the Tinkerer to outfit himself with some super-powered gear that he could use to take on Spider-Man. Otherwise, they'd have to come up with a reason why J. Jonah knows Matt Gargan. Him being a private investigator made a lot more sense. The fact that he's already a villain, those associations and connections don't really add up, so he'll probably take that on himself. A movie with multiple major threats tracking him at all times, with mini showdowns throughout, would be so damn fun. Throw in a weak attempt from the Shocker, because these movies need more of the Shocker being bad at what he does. Maybe even utilize Donald Glover's Prowler, who we've met the character but not the villain yet. And if the setups in Spider-Man 2 pay off, then we might also see the Chameleon, which somebody who can disguise themselves would be really mind-bending and play off Peter's paranoia and make him feel really isolated and alone. That would be one more cool dynamic. I know we're starting to lean into the too many villains third movie pitfall, but if they don't do it the way that superhero movies have failed to achieve in the past, and instead think of it like those tiered mini boss showdowns of John Wick, I think it could be perfect. One or two of the villains are undergoing their own arc at the same time, and the rest of them are just there as distractions and obstacles. Presumably, Adrian is going to repay his debt to Peter here, 
Sure, not snitching on him is, is one good thing that he's already done, but I think he's going to take that a step further, helping him either fight or escape when things seem particularly dicey. I also predict that he's going to be killed off defending Peter. I'm just saying. And it's even more likely that it would be Scorpion who is the one who takes him down. He doesn't really have any loyalty to Adrian. He specifically hates Spider-Man. He's going to be angry at Adrian for withholding that information from him. And I think when they come to blows, he's just going to stab him with his big Scorpion stinger and, and that'll be the end of it. If Kraven is out there, I think his focus is going to be way more on Peter. I don't think he's going to care about everyone else. He's probably going to be like this A tier to everyone else's B and C. And he'll just he'll just avoid conflicts with every other villain. He's not going to clash or tussle with them. He'll just avoid them and focus strictly on Spider-Man. Well, I think all the other villains are continuously getting in each other's way. Having Adrian come back would be a satisfying story arc and would also carry on the tradition of Peter being helped along this trilogy as he grows into his own. We've seen Peter grow so much much over these few Marvel movies, and I think Spider-Man 3 will really be the one where he comes into his own. Those mentor-like team-ups are going to be a core structural component of these three movies and aren't really going to be a thing moving forward. I'm sure he'll team up now and again, but it will be more like they're on the same level rather than them coaching him and instructing him. I think it would be interesting if the three post credit scenes taken by themselves kind of craft their own mini arc. So the first one is Matt Gargan hates Spider-Man. The second one, J. Jonah hates Spider-Man. Everyone knows that Peter Parker is Spider-Man. And in this third one, we'll carry on that little bit of a thread there. It could be like spaced out more than I'm thinking and that the third movie could end with Matt Gargan being broken out or being outfitted with the Scorpion costume. But I really think he's gonna have an actual villainous presence in the third movie. If they could delay it and have him be Scorpion in the fourth, but I think they're kind of trying to wrap up a few particular arcs here, and that setup from the first movie paying off in the third would make more sense than saving it for the fourth. Instead, what I think this post credit scene would be, would be something setting up the potential introduction of Venom. There are several different ways they can go about it. It's really going to depend on how much they lean on this multiverse stuff. It could be something as simple as showing J. Jonah's son getting ready to take off in his rocket. He's an astronaut, and in the old cartoon I love, he was directly responsible for bringing the symbiote back to Earth. It could also be him returning to Earth. Either set up there, same idea, but they, the payoff is the same. If the symbiote is instead going to come through the multiverse, then that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Instead, maybe that could be the first time that it shows Matt Gargan and Jay Jonah in a room together, indicating that they know each other and are now working together. The Spider-Man post-credits seem to be much more focused on setting up future Spider-Man, whereas every other Marvel movie, they just kind of bounce around to set up these larger stories. I imagine that has to do with being produced by Sony, that they probably say, like, hey, don't spend your movie advertising your other movies. Let's just keep things contained in a Spider-Man universe. Considering the timing of these movies, there's also the chance that Doctor Strange inadvertently brings back Venom. Hopping over to Sony's own Marvel Universe and bringing him along as a hitchhiker, or just opening up some sort of gateway through which Venom can travel. More than likely, rather than the entirety of the Venom symbiote just coming along for the ride, it'll spit off one of its spawns, the way that Carnage branches off from Venom. That way we have two kind of clones of the same thing so that both universes can continue to use the character. That ties in a lot more with my original theory of how things will play out. Or considering the spacefaring nature of Carol Danvers, there's a good chance that something is brought back in Captain Marvel 2. Considering the existing ordering of these movies and Sony's commitment to putting out a Spider-Man every two years, which is now kind of reshuffled with the delays, but assuming either a July 2023 or November 2023 for Spider-Man 4, that would put things closer to Captain Marvel 2. That might be more likely in the sense that the setup is a lot closer to the payoff. No matter through the means that it's introduced, I am predicting that we will see Tom Holland in the first ever Spider-Man 4, mind you, which is very exciting, acquiring the black suit. Something that people have wanted to see done right for so many years. One important caveat here is that if Gargan isn't Scorpion in Spider-Man 3 and they save that for Spider-Man 4, then there's no way we're seeing the black suit until Spider-Man 5. They'll want at least one movie with Gargan fully outfitted as Scorpion from beginning to end. They don't want him to ramp up to becoming Scorpion and then becoming Venom within one movie. That's not a very satisfying arc. And they really have been putting the time into letting us know these villains quite intimately. 
so we need at least one Scorpion movie. Whenever we finally get a, a name or trailer or tease of some kind casting news for Spider-Man 3, and if that informs whether or not Matt Gargan is going to be important to that movie, that should help inform how these are going to be structured. My prediction, he'll be important to 3, 4 will be the black suit Spidey, and 6 will be the Sinister Six, just because that makes way too much sense. Also, while we're chucking predictions out there, I think it would be fun to look at who the Sinister Six might actually be in that sixth movie. Not Vulture. He will have been killed off saving Peter already. He's featured in pretty much everyone else's lists when I was looking around at this. And no, I, I just don't think he's going to be around anymore by that time. Matt Gargan, either as Scorpion or Venom, regardless if he's been Venom yet within the movies, he just may or may not still be by this point. Mysterio. Although Beck is presumably dead, I imagine his team will use the same tech to haunt Peter. Craven, who's likely showing up in the next film. Shocker, I guess? All I want is for him to start showing up in these movies and immediately getting dummied. He is not going to be an important character there. Now the interesting thing is that if they do a Venom storyline black suit in Spider-Man 4, then that leaves five open for other character introductions, and I think we might see Dr. Octopus there. They have to start overlapping characters from the old movies at some point. And with this being the high school trilogy, the next three expected to be a college trilogy and three more after that, him being an adult, he'll probably meet Dr. Octopus in college as one of his professors. And so having Octopus show up in number five would make a lot of sense. And to organize that team, God willing, Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin. Oh, it would just be, it would just be so good. If not, then hopefully they've introduced the Osborne family by then, presumably in Spider-Man 4. And while he's been a, a good mentor and a friend and, and there for Peter, presumably meeting Harry, again, this stuff gets kind of messy when people all know now that Peter is Spider-Man. But I imagine he'll be a, a good character up until that point, stepping out into a more villainous role in the sixth film. Whether or not he steps up as simply being a crazy tech billionaire and an anti-Stark or full-on Green Goblin but I think they would probably save that for the adult trilogy. So many tangents here. Back to Mac Gargan's Venom. I just feel that it would work on so many levels and builds off of what's already been established. Because of the way they can spend the time setting it off and interplaying things, I just anticipate it'll be more satisfying than the Tom Hardy movie. This would be a symbiote who actually knows Peter intimately and knows him before working with any other villains. That means Venom would imitate his powers much more directly, and we would actually see the classic white logo. Over the course of several movies with Matt Gargan, we would get to know him a lot better. We can actually have Scorpion fleshed out as a villain. Maybe he's just a crazy guy who wants to kill Peter, but he might have his own specific motivations that are much more deeply layered into that. As he fails repeatedly, desperate to take on Spider-Man, it makes more sense that he would be accepting of this alien force that he doesn't understand. Pairing Venom's rejection by Peter with this all-fueling hatred of Spider-Man, there's no way Gargan would turn that down. Michael Mando is an incredible, amazing actor and would be wasted if they didn't give Matt Gargan some additional depth. Watching him struggle as Nacho in Better Call Saul, trying to be the villain but trying to look out for his family and still maintain some moral integrity has been phenomenal. I know a lot of people know him as just crazy unhinged from Far Cry, and I'm sure he'll eventually build up to that, but I want to see some more restrained Gargan before we get there. This would give us literally everything that we're looking for from the Eddie Brock Venom story arc. Some of that legwork has already been done. It just makes sense. There's no need to introduce Eddie and conflict with the Sony movies and come up with some new motivation for why Eddie would specifically hate Peter or any of that. Just work with what you already have. I know some people are not fans of the Matt Gargan Venom era in the comics. How Eddie and Venom separated was not particularly well liked. People were automatically going to be against it because Eddie Brock is Venom. That's just what people are most familiar with and changing it up was, was never going to be well received. But more than anything, his time with Matt Gargan, he became a wholly villainous character rather than morally gray. Sony is really committed to this anti-hero shtick. I don't know if that's going to play out in the long term. I think some of these bad guys have to start being bad. Venom is just so much more interesting when he's fueled by his hatred of Spider-Man. Even when he's trying to balance things out, 
that drive is pushing him towards evil way more often than not. He goes from being this conflicted hero to just the most murder-heavy, dangerous villain there is. I think they're gonna have to play into that a little bit more rather than simply having Matt Gargan's Venom be entirely unhinged. It provides Marvel with this really amazing opportunity to contrast the two iterations of the character. Sony can have Eddie and Venom working together as anti-heroes. Maybe it's a fresh new take to show how that character would work in a world devoid of Peter Parker, while Marvel can show Venom as being more chaotic neutral, aiding either Peter or Mac, but taking things too far in either case. It really makes the character more layered, nuanced, and intriguing. Venom absolutely hates Peter and Spider-Man. Scorpion absolutely hates Peter and Spider-Man. Mac is also a criminal, but not necessarily a murderer. There could be this interesting wrestling here, where Venom spent time with Spider-Man and kinda liked being a hero, and starts pushing Mac in that direction? Maybe Gargan starts to grow and like that himself. But Venom being superpowered and him not knowing his own strength, he might kill a few innocent bystanders. Now we have to see this internal conflict and wrestling as he tries to do good, he becomes a worse villain than ever. Watching this mutated, psychotic criminal wrestle with the emotional conflicts of singularly hating someone, trying to do good, and often doing bad could be so interesting. Marvel has taken greater care for giving us something to empathize with in their villains. Vulture, Mysterio, Thanos, and Killmonger have easily been their best, and they're the ones where they show us the villain's perspective. And I think that's what needs to be done here. I hope so sincerely that Sony agrees to continue working with Marvel, and they don't do it in a way where they step on each other's toes. It's a large world, a big old sandbox, you guys can both have your own separate toys and play around with them, and as a superhero fan and general blockbuster appeal, people are gonna go see both. One thing that I think was noteworthy is that even with all the pandemic blockbuster movie reshuffling, the ordering, specifically, of Morbius, Venom 2, and Spider-Man 3 remained consistent, indicating that that release order might actually be pretty important specifically for Sony's world building. I have no idea what they're working towards there. I'm excited to see what it is they have planned across those three movies. If Sony's overdoing their own thing and their own separate adjunct universe, I don't care what characters they ruin or what arcs they spoil. Through this, it gives Marvel the freedom to do their own thing without their hands being quite so tied. Using the multiverse really seems to be like the only way that they could really pay this off. Having two Eddie Brocks is just going to be wildly confusing, but two clearly delineated Venoms would make a lot of sense for everyone. Despite the fact that they'll have an entire movie setting that up, they can be distinguished by looking slightly differently in their designs, especially by having the white spider logo. That might be a lot for the general audience who's not specifically following all of this to keep track of, but I think we can give people the benefit of the doubt there. It's all I want. I think it would work. <laughs> I think this satisfies everything I could possibly want in that story arc. I'm very excited to have these two videos out there and then in many years time look back and see how I was wrong about every specific intimate detail of, of both of them honestly just more likely than me guessing any of this. If there's any writers for Marvel out there who wants to use any of this, go for it. No credit needed. I care more about seeing it be a reality. <laughs> Thank you guys all so much for watching. Let me know what you think, if you think this makes sense, if it would be satisfying, what you feel about the, the separate Sony and Marvel universes. I don't know, there's a lot to talk about. Please, please just share. Thank you to patrons of the channel. I, I always feel bad when I make a video like this that's entirely for myself more than anything, but I have to hope that these people chose to support the channel because that's, that's what they like to see as well as me having fun with this type of content. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you again soon.